Ten past boiled over yesterday at a public hearing organized by the House of Representatives Committee on Petroleum Industry Bill. It was a problem which source is known only to the representatives of the host communities, who at that point had been invited by the House Committee Chairman on PIB, Mohamed Munguno, to present their positions on the matter at hand. But that singular incident could be an aggregation of accumulated frustration which cuts across the oil-rich region, following decades of being continually stripped of their resources and, more critically, means of livelihood in the wake of pervasive environmental degradation. Joining us now to have a conversation about where exactly the lawmakers currently stand on the petroleum industry bill is Honorable Sergio Ogun, who represents Essen Northeast and Essen Southeast Federal Constituency of Edo State. He's also a member of the House Committee on the Petroleum Industry Bill. Welcome to the program, Honorable Sergio Sugun. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yes. Well, you are a member of the uh, Petroleum Industry Bill Committee in the uh, House of Representatives. And yesterday, uh, there was that commotion. Stakeholders uh, from the uh, Niger Delta area engaging themselves in uh, fisticals. Now, what was the cause of that commotion? Because we've, there are many versions out there, including persons who accuse the chairman of that committee of uh, causing the problem by saying only one person should speak on behalf of all the stakeholders in attendance. Well, uh, that was not really what happened. He had said host come, one of the umbrella bodies, should speak, and then he there was agitation, and he now said, okay, the communities should come and speak. So whatever happens, happened rather between the two gentlemen that fought uh, is probably something that came from the community. I don't know. But we're sitting side by side each other. So it's possible that there was a, a disagreement. Like I said, it's possible that started from the community and uh, only culminated yesterday in the public hearing. But... This is no big deal. Uh, for some of us that have been in the industry, this happens always when you have town hall meetings and all. I, although the chairman thereafter allowed them to speak, the host communities, that then the first person that came on was speaking when uh, a member of the committee moved a motion, uh, raised a point of order rather, that uh, maybe they should just uh no bother speaking that we were adopt the memorandum that they had submitted and uh, that's it but i don't think i that is right because i actually went to the chairman to speak against that they should be allowed to vent they should be allowed to speak uh these are some of the mistakes the oil companies the oil majors made so many years back when they called the host community stakeholders but in natural sense, they didn't treat them like stakeholders, you know, and then uh, that has degenerated into what we have today. If you remember, in the 70s, in the 80s, even in the early 90s, we didn't have any problem in the oil and gas industry, like the agitation and breaking of pipes and all. But because they took advantage of these people, they thought they were just gentle people and they didn't know what was happening, they ignored them, and we are paying a heavy price for it today. So I think we... I have advised, and I will repeat it here, we should consult more, we should engage more. Because as much as we give attention to OPTS, that's the oil producing uh, trade section, who are the oil producers, basically, we should give attention to those that the oil is in their backyard. Because if you don't do that, beside the fact that you cannot extract the oil, the cost of extracting it will be very expensive. Our problem in Nigeria, basically, is not subsurface. It's not underground. The technology for extracting crude oil is basically the same everywhere. But the problem is the cost of going to the rig, the cost of evacuating the product. So that's why the cost is very, is very high. And now we are talking about cost of production over $20 in Nigeria, average. It's not acceptable. Most of the countries we are competing with, price of crude oil, daily production, is less than... $200 per day. So I think we should give more attention to them. Okay. 
So bringing resource dividends to the oil producing community and the host community seems fair and just. And so I have two questions for you. Uh, first, can you explain what has warranted the slash uh, to 2.5% of operating expenditure stated in the PIB as against the initial 10% that was proposed uh, by the Yaadwa administration when this bill was proposed? Um, that is one. Two, how will this uh, petroleum fund uh, for the host community differ from the other intervention programs for the Niger Delta region, such as the OMPADEC, the NDDC, you know, that have little or no impact over the years due to corruption? Well, the, the our proposals, whether it was 10% under the Erado administration or 2.5, they are proposals. We don't have an act yet, it's just a bill. And that's why what happened yesterday day before yesterday and yesterday happened because it's public hearing. The bill is a proposal, basically. Then stakeholders, civil society, the operators, oil operators, the communities, well, and everybody, we're all supposed to come together and say, okay, we are in agreement with 2.5. No, we should raise it to 5%. Matter of fact, the host communities are asking for minimum 10%. So it's acceptable. It's a way of making law. So you have to sit down, aggregate the opinion of everybody, and then go out and write, and then, you know, and hopefully it will be accepted. So nothing is casting on, nothing nothing has been agreed on yet, basically. So on um, how to manage the, the resources or what will change? Well, if you ask me, I think the challenge basically has not been with the Niger Delta. Now you have an NDDC that reports to the presidency. It should have been a regional affair. I mean, the oil producing states should have been the ones running NDDC. There is no one oil producing state today that is happy with the way we currently run NDDC. No one. And you heard it the last time protesting about the projects. People come into the states and they start executing the project. Most times, either they have that project in their budget or they have actually even done it. And people go and invoice for it. So that's one. If you talk about on and all that, basically the same thing. So if the federal government really wants to do something in the Niger Delta, they should hands off. Now, even the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs, it should be a regional ministry again. The federal character, there should be largely people from the oil producing state that should be working there. So it's a case of you give it one, one hand and you use your other hand to collect it. The... The, the fund, you talk about how it's going to be managed. There's supposed to be a board that will manage that fund. Again, these are things the oil producing states made their presentations, suggesting basically that maybe some the people of indigenous from the oil community should be the ones to manage it. Others are saying, well, it should be statewide. All that will be looked into. That is why this is what happened, what's happening, or what happened this week in the Senate and in the House is called public hearing. We're going to aggregate all that and then arrive at something. Uh, we hope we are not throwing the baby away with the bathwater because it seems like that to me. And so it's so quick to talk about this proposal of a community trust now to manage funds. But we forget, and you keep saying federal character, but we forget that states have their own oil development commission. You have the Sopanek in Delta State. that a lot of people say has been replaced with corruption. And across other states, too, that are oil producing states. So if you have states that are, you know, regional, that have their own uh, the development commission, and it has not worked, what would, how, what would this one be? A lot of people have argued that this would just be corruption on the community level, rather than the federal level or the state level. That's what it would be. I want you to, to react to that first. Secondly, I want you to tell me a way that we can truly have sustainable development, because all this replete in the bill are things that have been tried one way or the other before. You'll you respond after the break, sir. We'll come after the break. We'll talk to you. Sir. Just join us. We have Honorable Sergio Soko. We are talking everything about PIB. Just to rephrase the questions, uh, at first, a lot of people are arguing that this will just be community on a corrup on, uh, corruption on a community level. Since we've had things like the Super Deck and some other development commission in the states, and we still have cases of corruption, 
And uh, secondly, what is the pathway for development? Because you said in the 70s, 80s, you know, we didn't have agitations of the Niger Delta struggle. But I, I keep, I ask you in return, why did the likes of Isaac Adakaburu carry guns in the 60s to declare Niger Delta Republic if there were not these issues of minority rights being trampled upon? So what's the pathway to even solving the Niger Delta question once and for all? Those two questions, sir. Yeah, I, I think we need to build confidence. That is very important. And then, like I said, engage, engage, and engage, you know, consult with the people. Now, I, there is no facet of our life today in Nigeria where there is no corruption. Let's be honest. Let's start even from recruitment. Today, you, are, you see, you are talking about police recruitment or even in the civil service. And you're hearing that 90, 90, okay, 50, something percent of those people are going to Katina and all that. Yet, we have a federal character uh, in place as a law. Okay. Talking about engaging the people, we have the Indorama strategy. As you remember, Indorama was bought over by the Indians, it was a petrochemical. When it was being operated by government, there were, there were losses. Because of the losses, Obasanjo administration sold it. When Obasanjo administration sold it, they were making losses. The Indorama, the Indian guys, borrowed money to buy that company. Within the first one year, after doing the turnaround maintenance, they started making profit. But this is a strategy. The community have a stake. The state have a stake. I think the federal still have, um, still have a percentage. And then the company. So with that, everybody is on board. With the present PIB, now you have clause 53 says that the company is going to be wholly owned by NNPC. So some of us are saying that should not be the case. It should be private, public. So the community should be part owner. The state should be part owner. Then the federal government, and then the private sector. So the industry should be investor-driven. Then I give you an example. The NLNG. Private investors have 51 percent as against the federal government 49 percent so because of that the board is largely managed by the private sector or headed by the private sector and look at the huge dividends that's coming from nlng to the country today so if you take away this discretion from people and allow the system to work we will cut down largely on this corruption that's plaguing us there's corruption everywhere in the world, but by the time we personalize it, by the time we allow for too much discretion, you have corruption. So talking about the systems we have on the on deck and all, there has been corruption. Tell me anywhere in the civil service where there's no corruption. Even in the private sector, why I don't dwell too much on the private sector is if you have a company and the people working there are embezzling your money, what do you do? You sack them. You audit. But with the federal, uh, federal agencies, who is auditing? Go and check. When was the last time most of these agencies were audited? You don't have ISO system, the International Standard Organization specification for running an agency. You don't have it in the public uh, sector. So I think if we take our discretion and, and we allow investors to put their money in, build confidence, which I think the PIB is trying to do, you know, and we will, we will eliminate corruption to a large extent. <laughs> Well, when we were trying to uh, reconnect with you, I raised the uh, concern about the fact that this is the oldest bill before the uh, National Assembly in Nigeria, moving from one assembly to the other for over 20 years. Now, we have this big problem on our hands, the problem of trust. We've seen that the communities, the stakeholders, they don't trust themselves. The um, oil companies, they don't trust the host communities. Uh, the uh, stakeholders also do not trust the lawmakers. And yet, the National Assembly is saying this bill uh, will be passed into law, uh, whatever happens uh, during the life of this administration. What is the guarantee that that will happen? And what's the level of synergy uh, on this particular bill within the National Assembly, between the uh, two chambers of the uh, Assembly? Yeah, I have, thank you. I have heard the Senate President say we will pass this bill first quarter. The day before yesterday, when the speaker came to open the public hearing, he said, we will pass this bill 
hopefully by April. I know where they are coming from. What I, my, my understanding is they are trying to let everybody know that, look, this bill must pass as soon as possible. And it's in our best interest for this bill to pass like yesterday. Between 2015 and 2019, because last year, 2020, not much happened, 70 billion USD came into Africa, into oil and gas. And the last time I checked, we we're supposed to be the largest oil producers in Africa. Only $3 billion came into Nigeria. And you don't need to ask why. So if 20 years ago we came out and said, look, we need to have a fiscal regime. We need to have a bill that will, will dictate what happens in the industry, a modern bill. And everybody's watching. Because, I mean, how you will not invest your money into a, in a country where you don't know how you can take the money out or how much profit you are going to make. Most of these big investments, I'll give you an example of ExxonMobil investing 37 billion USD in Mozambique. Because the FID, the return on investment, is based on certain parameters on what I'm going to take out, what's going to be my margin, or the profitability going forward. So confidence building is very important. As I just gave an example of the Indorama strategy, which is working perfectly well. And again, you talk about the distrust between the National Assembly, between the host communities and all. That's not an issue. With proper engagement, we can take care of that. I, I think I gave this example in your studio once. So many years ago, one of the oil companies went to a community over 30 something years ago to drill. And the agreement with the community was that they were going to sand fuel because the community said we need to we need to sand fuel certain places for us. And they said, okay. What happened? They drilled and they left. The community went back to them, they ignored them. 20 something years later, they came back to go and maintain those wells, to go and complete the wells, maintain them, basically. Now they had the massive rig, one of its kind all over the world, wow. that can drill cluster wells, standing in one place. Wow. Draw the string in from... Honorable Ogun, that's all we'll be able to take, uh, you know, due to constraint of time. But thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, and explaining all the uh, these important issues. Thank you.